Father in heaven, Lord, we've come a long way as we've studied through the book of Revelation. We've come all the way from chapter 1 into chapter 13 now, and we're heading into chapter 14 and 15 and on. And Lord, there's a lot of, a lot of things in the center of Revelation here, uh, especially in chapter 13 and 14, and some very serious things, serious issues. And so, Lord, we're just praying that your Holy Spirit would come and help us to understand because you said that you gave your Holy Spirit so that he might lead us into all truth. And so, Lord, we're claiming that as a promise tonight, that your Holy Spirit and only your Holy Spirit would lead us into the truth that's in your word and is the truth that is revealed to us uh, in Scripture and history. So thank you. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, uh, tonight, my clicker is not working. <laughs> All right, let's try this again. There we go. Probably none of us are alive that we remember the uh, famous rendition of the War of the Worlds on radio back in 1938 or so, 37 or so. It was a huge phenomenon, and it was a hoax, right? I mean, but, but all along the eastern uh, seaboard there and, and inland quite a bit, those that could pick up the radio show, they thought for sure that Martians had landed and were beginning to destroy city after city and person after person. And it was a real thing for many people. They were scared to death. And, uh, and then, of course, we have... Uh, some of us who have followed some science, the Piltdown Man. Piltdown Man was somebody that was found, uh, supposedly a skeleton that was found in England that revealed the transition from the Cro-Magnum Man, or the, I should say the Neanderthal Man to the Cro-Magnum Man in, um, in archeology span or paleontology, whichever. And it uh, turns out that it was a big hoax, that there were some scientists that actually fabricated it out of a gorilla, pieces of gorilla skull and things like that. And so it had taken the, 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 the world by storm when it was first presented. They thought, you know, now evolution is showing, you know, that we have some transitions here between uh, ancient uh, peoples and more modern ones. And then how many of you remember the crop circles? That wasn't that long ago, you know, where all of a sudden these mysterious circles began appearing in people in these farmers' fields like this. And uh, there was speculation, this is what alien um, spaceships were landing there. And it got big press for a long time until finally they found out that there was a young farmer that figured out how to make these and it just took everybody by storm, right? Everybody went for a ride. And uh, then, of course, there's this guy. Anybody recognize him? How many of you have seen him? No, don't raise your hand. <laughs> Actually, there was one, I think, down in New Mexico just recently, supposedly a couple saw him out, uh, outside the train that they were riding in. So the Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Yeti, whatever you were going to call him, uh, he's out there, and everybody or a lot of people feel that he's definitely real. Well, is it a hoax or not? I, I'm real suspicious about it myself. And then, of course, there's the mark of the beast, right? And there's been a lot written on that, uh, such as this one, The Mark of the New World Order by uh, a man named Terry Cook. And then, of course, there's The Mark of the Beast, Part 1, The Antichrist. And that is referring to The Mark of the Beast being that, that uh, barcode, you know, that's going to be imprinted on people's minds. How many of you heard that being The Mark of the Beast? Yeah, there's, you know, that's a, a theory out there. And then, of course, we have... Um, the latest one, probably the most recent one, are wondering if the COVID vaccine is the mark of the beast. So that one's out there. That may be new to you, but that's come up. Uh, I've heard that President Obama was the, was the beast power, you know, and he was going to, to bring about the mark of the beast. And then, of course, that uh, microchip that they implant in your hand, and that's the mark of the beast as well. So this is just a little smattering of the different concepts that are out there about the mark of the beast. And kind of like the Piltdown Man and kind of like uh, the War of the Worlds by Orson Welles, 
a lot of this stuff is um, kind of suspect, I would say. Now, there's no question that there's plenty of conspiracies that take place out there. Any of you that have studied history, you know that there were, in fact, things that happened under the radar that we didn't know about until later. So I'm not here to say that conspiracies don't happen, but there are better explanations for some things than other things. And when it comes to the mark of the beast, what we need to do is we need to let the Bible guide us in making the decision on what it is and what it isn't. Uh, I mentioned the other night that when it came to deciding what the different beast in the book of, or the book of Daniel represent and also in the Re book of Revelation, um, I, I found that there are a number of theologians of today that have said, well, the, the winged lion, I, I mentioned this the other night, the winged lion in Daniel chapter 7, well, that has to represent uh, Britain because after no, all, we know that Britain is known for its, its lion. You know, the lion is kind of the, the symbol for that. And then, of course, uh, it's not so much today, but I think it's still true that the bear happens to represent Russia, you know, in our modern day uh, experience. And so they say that the bear in Daniel 7, uh, it happens to be Russia. And uh, then the leopard, you know, somebody else and that sort of thing. And the problem with that that I, I, that I brought out is that when you start using present day symbols, to identify things that were written back in 605 BC, you're gonna start having problems because that is not what Daniel and the rest of the people understood those symbols to represent. And as we looked at it, we, re we realized that from Daniel's perspective in history, that the winged lion was un unequivocally a symbol of Babylon. It was stamped on all of its bricks. The bear definitely represented uh, Medo-Persia because Medo-Persia actually came from a mountainous area where there were bears, you know, and it fit that. In fact, uh, I didn't mention this, but when Medo-Persia uh, overtook Babylon and the rest of the, the uh, nations there, Lydia and, and Egypt, it was a relatively slow-moving campaign. And that's what bears typically do. They're slow-moving. Uh, whereas a leopard with wings, that's pretty fast, right? Or a lion with wings, which was indica indica in indicative of, of Babylon's conquering and also Greece. So, so when we look at deciding what the mark of the beast is, we're going to go from the Bible and we're going to look at history and the facts that we can dis uh, uh, d uh, discern from history. Now, as we start, I want to show you something here. Uh, Revelation 16, 13 is uh, a chapter coming up, and the chapters from chapter 13 on into, actually the rest of the book up into chapter 18, is all going to be dealing with the, the dragon and the, the woman and the false woman, which is a false church, and the, the um, false prophet and things like that. And so, I just want to show you this as we start to get into our, our subject tonight. In Revelation 16, 13, it says, And I, John, saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and it'll say out of the mouth of the, the um, um, false prophet, and et cetera. And so I want to show you something of what these symbols mean here. So when we look at frogs, it says spirits like frogs. First of all, what's coming out of um, the mouth of the dragon? It's an unclean spirit that's like a frog. So we already know that it's evil, right? Well, when you think of a frog, what do you think of? Besides slimy, right? How, how do frogs catch their prey? with their tongues, right? Yeah. And so this frog is coming out of the mouth of the, of, the, of the dragon. And the mouth is important here because out of the mouth of the frog, it catches its victims. And so what it's sharing with us in a symbolic way is that 
from these three entities, they are going to be a part and parcel to the devil's modus operandi, which is what? To lie his way, to deceive his way into people's lives. And so that's what the symbolism of this frog is all about, because the frog catches things with its tongue. We speak with our tongues, right? And so the dragon, when he first talked in the Garden of Eden, what kind of language did he use? Truth or lies? He used lies, right? So with his tongue, as it were, he caught Eve. And so it goes on to say, out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth, mouth of the false prophet. So there's three here, three entities, that will be warring against God's people and actually the rest of the world, as we'll get into this a little bit later. So it's the beast, it's the, it's the dragon, it's the beast, it's the false prophet. The dragon is none other than Lucifer or Satan. The beast is the Roman Catholic Church. We've identified that already. We'll continue that tonight. The false prophet is another name for the United States of America. As we identified the land beast in Revelation 13, we, we recognized that it would unfortunately end up speaking like a dragon. And later on in Revelation, it will call it the false prophet. And I'll show you why uh, in just a minute. So you remember where I told you that, that there are parallels between the beginning of the Bible and uh, parallels with things at the end of the Bible. Remember I said that? Like, for instance, there's, there's the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, and in the end of Revelation, it says the, the tree of life will be restored, right? There's the act of creation in, in the beginning, the very beginning of the Bible, and then there's the act of recreation at the very end. And I could go on and on, but it shows that there is a chiastic structure of the, of the entire Bible. There are parallels like that. Well, I want to show you the parallel here. We've just identified or, or looked at the dragon, the beast, and the uh, false prophet here in Revelation at the end of the Bible. If we look at what was taking place in Eden in the beginning of the Bible, we find that there's nothing new under the sun. Because guess what? The dragon was in the Garden of Eden. Now, just like in the book of Revelation, does the devil do, do his own dirty work? No, he uses somebody else to do his dirty work, right? And so who did he use in the Garden of Eden? He used the serpent, right? So there's a beast as well, right? It's very prominent. So the dragon uses the beast the, 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 the serpent, to deceive whom? To deceive Eve. And guess what happened when, when Eve was deceived? She became the false prophet. Well, Pastor, how did she become a false prophet? Well, who did she go to and share the fruit with? Her husband. And what should she tell him? She told him, you know, this has made me like a god. It's just like the serpent said, and she lied, she, 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 she transmitted those lies to her husband, didn't she? And so we see that there's nothing new under the sun. The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet were in the Garden of Eden, just like they are in the last days here in Revelation. All right, so let's remind ourselves that right outside the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve were taken out of the garden, and they had Cain and Abel, that there was a problem that immediately arose with these two young boys. Remember that? We looked at that the other night, and we realized that there is a controversy. At the very beginning of the Bible, there's a controversy over how to worship God. Now, sometimes we don't pick this up, but I want to show you uh, what we're dealing with here. So the controversy is over two different altars. Cain had an altar. Was he worshiping God? Yes, he was. Abel had an altar. Was he worshiping God? Yes, he was. But God only accepted one altar. Do you remember that? And so there's the altar where the lamb was slain, which Revelation says that Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That's what it represented. 
So from the very beginning, God gave them the promise that he would come as the lamb to save them from their sins. Okay, that's the first altar where we're to worship at. But then we have a second altar, and that was the altar that Cain built. And what did Cain bring as an offering? Did he bring what God asked him to bring? No, he brought what he wanted to bring, which was fruits and vegetables and things that he felt was okay. Did God accept that worship? No, he didn't. So we have a controversy here about, and unfortunately he killed his brother uh, and the Lord placed upon him a mark and it was because it was all over the issue of worship. You see that? Right at the very beginning of our history. Now what we're going to see here is we have the same thing going on at the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation. There are two altars. There's one where uh, those follow the lamb wherever he goes and they receive the seal of God. There's the other one where they follow the beast and they, wherever he goes and they receive the mark of the beast. It's all about worship once again. So once again, you see this parallel, right? The parallel of how everything started in a very simple form in the Garden of Eden or outside the Garden of Eden and then at the very end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, we see the same thing. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's where we're coming from, and we identified the seal last night, so now we're going to look at the mark of the beast. All right, the warning against worshiping the beast is the most urgent given in the book of Revelation. I mean, it is really incredible when you... Uh, Read what, what God says. In fact, I'm going to read it from the Bible, Revelation 14, uh, verse 9 and, and 10. God says, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of of the lamb. So after reading that, how many of you want to receive the mark of the beast? Yeah, this is a serious, serious uh, problem here that God is pointing out. We do not want to receive the mark of the beast. It's one of the most serious warnings that the book of Revelation has. Now, God's seal, we contended last night, stands in contrast to the beast mark, all right? God's seal and God's law are in, their fo in the forehead. Remember, we saw that, that God uh, put his, his law in our minds and in our hearts. In fact, I think I've got it up here. The new covenant, uh, which is quoted in Revelation, or excuse me, Hebrews 8.10 says, I will put my laws into their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So we know that the seal of God has all to do with his law as we saw last night, and he writes it where? In the mind, in the frontal lobe where we make our decisions. And so um, we want to remind ourselves why we're talking about the law at this point in our study of Revelation. I, I'm trying to go systematically through this, and, I, and I'm not going to apologize because I am repeating myself, but I want us to, to see how this all links together and point by point. So why are we talking about the law so much in our study of Revelation here? Well, remember when we saw this um, at the very beginning? We saw that Jesus is walking through the sanctuary as, as we are reading through the sanctuary. That as he goes through the sanctuary, he goes to the candlestick, goes to the table of showbread, goes to the altar of incense. Now we find that he's... Uh, in the most holy place by the Ark of the Covenant. So as we've literally been reading and studying through the Revelation, we've been also seeing him progressing through the sanctuary. And remember, the sanctuary is the key. It tells us how God is going to save us and bring us into glory, all right? So it also reveals to us the beginning of man's history and the end of man's history. As, as the high priest comes out of the most holy place, he announces the judgment, basically, those that are saved and those that are lost, and the second coming takes place. And that's the end of human history in, in its um, 
fallen state, as it were. That's when Jesus comes back in the clouds of glory. All right? We saw that Revelation 1 through 11 reveals to us Jesus only in the holy place. When it, when it introduces each of the different prophecies, the, the seven uh, churches, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, we see him by the candlestick, we see him by the showbread, we see him by the altar of incense. Nothing, nowhere else. We don't see him uh, by the Ark of the Covenant yet, uh, while, while we're still between uh, Revelation 1 and Revelation 12, or, uh, 11, verse 19, actually. And then at Revelation 11, 19, for the first time, we see Jesus in front of the Ark of the Testament, Ark of his Covenant. And that reveals to us that Jesus has moved in the heavenly sanctuary from the holy place into the most holy place, okay? Uh, Revelation eleven nineteen. 19. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And we discovered, as we talked about that, that within the ark of the covenant is what? The Ten Commandments, right? So when we, be, when we continue to read now from eleven nineteen on in Revelation, we begin to see a number of scriptures that talk about the Ten Commandments. Didn't talk about it in the first part of Revelation there at all in, in 11 chapters. But now we begin to see the, the scriptures talking about the importance of the Ten Commandments. We know that when the high priest in the earthly sanctuary went into the uh, most holy place, it was on the Day of Atonement. And the Jewish people understood that to be a day of judgment. So we can expect that because the sanctuary is God's plan of how he's going to save us, how he's going to bring us into glory, then as Jesus moves into the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary, we can assume that it's become the day of atonement for mankind. All right? So what does that mean? Uh, Revelation 14, 7, never talked about this before, but now in chapter 14, after we see the Ark of the Covenant, the first angel says, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his what? Of his judgment has come. Why? Because we know that once we've seen the Ark of the Covenant, we know that Jesus is now in the most holy place. And because Hebrews tells us he's our high priest, we know he's there, and he's in the process of cleansing the sanctuary, getting ready for the second coming. Because as he cleanses the sanctuary, he's deciding who's saved and who's not. Because when the high priest came out of the holy, most holy place, he either pronounced a blessing on the people of Israel, or he pronounced a curse, right, or judgment. And so at the second coming, Jesus is going to come, and the Bible says in Revelation, and my reward is with me right? So it means that he's had to have made a decision who's saved and who's lost, because what's Jesus' reward? It's eternal life, right? It's going to heaven, and for those that are lost, it's, it's death. All right, so uh, here's our timeline that we looked at a while back, and we were looking at the Ephesus church, the first seal, or the, or the seals, the seven trumpets, and then the prophecy of, Dan of of Revelation 12, and we saw that historically, as we've walked through each of these prophecies, we've come down into the 1800s, 1840s, right? And that is where we first see Jesus moving in to the most holy place. And we discovered that at the end of the 2,300-year prophecy of Daniel 9, Daniel 8 and 9, that that, that that took place in 1844. So that is the time that God told us that Jesus would move into the most holy place. So from the, from the time of 1844, all the human race, the planet Earth, has been living in the Day of Atonement. Okay? That's the time period that we're living in. That's the Day of Judgment. That is when the high priest is making a decision who's saved and who's lost. Okay? All right, let's continue. Revelation 12, 17, uh, not a few verses later uh, from when we saw the Ark of the Covenant, it says that it introduces the, the remnant 
and how the dragon was, was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. For the first time now, we see the importance of the Ten Commandments, that God's remnant people in the last time are identified by what? The, those that keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. We'll talk about the testimony of Jesus another night, but right now we're focusing on the, the Ten Commandments, all right? And then we see in Revelation 14, 7, that first angel's message, it also talks about judgment. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his, of his judgment has come. So I, I'm just trying to show you that right after we see the Ark of the Covenant, and the first time we see Jesus uh, having um, a vision, or John having a vision of the Ark of the Covenant, that's when we get all this talk about the, the judgment and also the Ten Commandments, Okay. All right, uh, goes on and it says, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. So in this time period, we saw last night that there is a critical need for people to make a decision of who they're going to worship. Now, when I was an atheist, I basically said that I didn't worship anything. You know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't believe in a God. But the, real, the reality is the dirty secret for every evolutionist is that they have gods too. My God was science, okay? That I believed everything that science said. And when you, when you, put, God, when you put science of, up like that, as you, you're only going to believe something if it's scientifically provable, you've just created a God, all right? Now, I, wouldn't have, I would have argued against you back in those days, but I know that's true today because that's the essence of what a God is. You kowtow to whatever your idol or whatever your, your uh, issue is there. So it's all about worship. Now, why is it important about worship? Remember when Jesus met the woman at the well and they were arguing? Uh, you know, small argument, obviously. Uh, John 4, verse 23 and 24. Jesus said, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in what? Spirit and truth. There are a lot of churches today that worship in spirit, but they don't have the truth. Or there are some churches that worship the true, in the truth, but they don't have the spirit. And so Jesus said there's a combination here. They worship in spirit and in truth. And how important did we decide the truth was the other night? It's absolutely vital. You can get yourself killed if you're not following the truth, all right? And in this issue, how important was the truth in the Garden of Eden when, when Eve was contemplating eating that fruit from the forbidden tree? It was life and death because through her eating that fruit, sin entered the human race. And we all have inherited, or I should say we're infected with that sin. Because of that's a huge result of not following the truth, right? And so truth is extremely important here. All right, Jesus told us in uh, John, John 14, 15, and 24, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Just sharing that to remind you that Jesus' commandments are his Father's commandments. His Father's commandments are Jesus' commandments because Jesus also said, I and the Father are one. So we don't have two sets of, of commandments here. We have one. Everything that Jesus spoke were the words that his Father gave him. In fact, I think it's in the, in the NIV, the New uh, International Version. It says, I do exactly, or I speak exactly what my Father says. All right, and then we learned in Isaiah 8, verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there's how much light in them? No light in them. So over and over again, we see these, and I know I'm rehearsing this again, but it's important as we get into this subject. All right, let's take a look at Revelation 13 timeline. We looked at this as we were identifying the sea beast in Revelation 13. And we identified the first beast that rises out of the sea as the Roman Catholic Church. Now friends, I am not sharing anything with you that is not historically um, 
what has been taught in the Christian church from the very beginning, especially in the Reformation time. There are scholar after scholar after scholar that have understood these truths. These are not new truths. It's only recently that we've begun to see something strange happening where Protestants are now uh, abandoning the protest and they're wanting to join back together with the Catholic Church. We've been seeing that. It's, a, it's an ecumenical movement. But the problem is, is that the reasons that the Reformation came up have not been dealt with, have not changed. Okay? There are certain teachings in the Catholic Church that um, are still there that are not in the Bible. Now, we'll take a look at some of that in just a second. So we saw that Pope or, or Emperor Justinian uh, sent out a decree that raised the Pope in, in uh, Rome to the highest echelon, that he was the, to be the pastor, the patriarch over all Christendom. That was in 538 AD. And from that point on, prophecy taught, ta taught us or prophesied that for 1,260 years that the beast would make war against the saints. Again, as we look at history, we know that historically that the Catholic Church did war against anybody that did not believe as they believed. And I, in fact, I was just reading the other day, I said uh, 50,000 is the, uh, or 50 million, I should say, is the number that they put to death. I read where they said 100 million that they put to death during that time. These were people that believed in the Lord and were trying to stay true to the Bible, but they were, did not believe what the Roman Catholic Church taught, and they were not willing to be subservient to the Pope, which was what they required. So the beast made war against them. Then in 1798, we found that the, the beast received a mortal wound the papacy received a mortal wound, and right after he went into captivity, there was the rise of the second beast, the land beast, which we identified as the United States of America last night. Was it last night or the night before? I can't remember. All right, so let's take a look and, and remember what happened in 1798. This is from uh, Rome, the full, from the fall of the Western Empire, George Trevor. The object of the French directory was the destruction of the pontifical government. This is when Napoleon came to power and the French hated the Catholic Church. Now what's the irony of this is, is that France was the very first nation that accepted Catholicism. Way back when the Franks, the, 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 German, or the tribe, began to populate the French area and they became staunch Catholics. But over the centuries, there was a lot of, lot of um, uh, terrible things that were perpetrated on the French people. And they got to the point by the time of the uh, French Revolution that they hated the papacy. And so they, um, they, they, they named it as an irreconcilable enemy of the Republic. The aged Pope, Pius VI, was summoned to surrender the temporal government. On his refusal, he was dragged from the altar. Now, let me give you a picture of how, how the Catholic Church worked in those days. The Catholic Church owned about half of Europe. Think about that. That's how powerful they were. They owned about half of Europe land-wise, but they also owned a lot of, most of the governments. They directed them in what to do and what not to do. Their, their uh, excommunicating would just, would, would turn a, a nation or a kingdom on their head. So he was dragged from the altar. His rings were torn from his fingers, and finally, after declaring the temporal power abolished, the victors, that's the Pope, or I mean the, the French, carried the Pope prisoner into Tuscany, whence he never returned, 1798. The territorial possessions of the clergy and the monks were declared national property, and their former owners cast into prison. This is what happened in, in France, especially. All right, continues, the papacy was extinct. Not a vestige of his existence remained, and among all the Roman Catholic powers, not a finger was stirred in its defense all through Europe. This is what was taking place. The Eternal City had no longer prince or pontiff. Its bishop was a dying captive in, a foreign, in foreign lands, and the decree was already announced that no successor would be allowed in its place. 
This was that mortal wound that took place in 1798. Okay? When, in 1798, Pope Pius VI fell grievously ill. Napoleon gave orders that in the event of his death, no successor should be elected to his office and that the papacy should be discontinued. That's, and he had power in those days to do that. But the Pope recovered, and the peace was soon broken. Then uh, Napoleon's general birth year entered Rome on the 10th of February, 1798, and proclaimed a republic. The aged pontiff was, refused to violate his oath by recognizing it and was hurried from prison to prison in France. Broken with fatigue and sorrows, he died in August 1799 in the French for fortress of Valence, aged 82 years. No wonder that half of Europe thought Napoleon's veto would be obeyed, and that with it, the Pope, uh, with the Pope, the papacy was dead. Now, I want to get across to you how big an event this was for Europe. You see, the papacy had ruled, had a heavy thumb on all the nations of Europe for thousands of years. We're not just talking hundreds of years. Our nation is only like, what, 275 years old, something like that. We don't have that much history. But the history here goes deep. And they had never known a time when the papacy, the papacy was on, wasn't on the top. And for this to happen, it was a shock. It was an earthquake, as it were. And when they saw the power of Napoleon and the French and what happened, they literally thought the papacy was dead, just like the prophecy had said. Revelation 13, 3, and I saw one of its heads as it had been mortally wounded, it says, right? Mortally wounded means a death blow. But then it goes on to say, and his deadly wound was healed. Well, as we know historically, the papacy limped on. It no longer had its lands. It no longer had the Vatican, really. It was a prisoner within Rome. Uh, today it has a, a state, as it were, that's the, called the Vatican, and it's sovereign in its own, but it didn't have that in 1798. But then, and so let's look, take a look at when that took place, 17, uh, excuse me, the mortal wound would be healed in 1929. And so we see this uh, from a um, newspaper, the San Francisco Chronicle, and it says Mussolini and Gaspari sign historic Roman pact. And it says uh, in uh, 1929, the Roman question tonight was a thing of the past, and the Vatican was at peace with Italy. In affixing the autographs to the memorable document, was it next words there? Healing the wound, extreme cordiality was displayed on both sides. What happened is that Mussolini realized that if he was going to rise to power, he needed the help of the papacy. And so he decided that he would give back the papal lands, the Vatican, what was called the Vatican today, to the papacy, and it now had its own land, and today it is considered a sovereign country, even though it's within the city of Rome. And so it healed that wound that had taken place. It gave back the power to the papacy. Not all the lands that it had lost, but the land where it would at least allow it to have an existence. And it's interesting, in this secular newspaper, it uses the exact words of prophecy, healing the wound, the mortal wound. Amazing stuff how God knew from the beginning. Revelation 13, 11 goes on, and then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. We identified that as the United States of America came up in 1798 about that time in a, in a place that was not very populated and right after the papacy goes into captivity. But it spoke like a dragon. And then it goes on to say, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. So friends, we're looking at prophecy to come, and what God is telling us is that, unfortunately, this second beast is going to end up exercising the same kind of power that the first beast had. All right? And it's going to speak like a dragon. And causes the earth and those who dwell on it, or in it, to worship the first beast. There's that word again, always popping up. It's all about worship here. There's a problem with worship. Dwell in it to worship the first beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword 
and lived. So the United States at some point in its future history is going to speak like a dragon and he's going to cause all the earth to make an image to the beast. Right? That's what it says here. Now, what does this mean, an image to the beast? And if, it, if we're wondering which beast it is, it's the one that was wounded by the sword and lived. So it's talking about the Catholic Church here. It's the, the papacy. All right, so sometime after 2023, we're going to see, unfortunately, our great nation going to speak like a dragon. It's going to make an image to the beast, and the mark of the beast will come up. All right, that's the future that we're looking at. And we don't know exactly how that's going to happen, but we can discern a certain number of things um, up to that point. Now, in Revelation 13, verse 7, it says, And authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Now, this is talking about the first beast. So when we're looking at what's this image mean that the second beast is going to, is going to make, it's talking about this as part of it. The image is going to include authority over the entire world, all right? Now, does the United States have the ability to affect the entire world? Well, it certainly does. You know, with the fall of, of uh, the USSR, uh, Russia, uh, we became the only superpower, right? And even though China is growing stronger and stronger, we know prophetically that it's not going to become the top dog even though there are people that are worried about the power of China. And the reason is the prophecy says that there's only one beast that's going to have this power. And so the United States is going to be able to overcome those other powers that are vying for attention. All right, so what that image looks like then, as we look at this map of the old Roman Empire, we see, and I don't know if you can see it up there, but we see the Diocese of Gaul, the Diocese of Spain, the Diocese of Italy, the Diocese of Africa, the Diocese of Egypt. What the Roman Church did is it divided up the whole old Roman Empire into different dioceses. And that's how they controlled and influenced the different nations. When they did that, it was not just that they were taking care of the spiritual needs of the people. They had power centers in each of those dioceses where they could influence the governments in those areas. And so they would cause the governments to do their bidding. It goes on to say in verse 8, and all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of the life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, when it says um, the earth will worship him, what it's getting at here is worship in this sense is not necessarily where you're in love with somebody and you worship them because you love, for instance, Jesus. Worship in this sense is also meaning that you're obeying them, even though you might not agree with them. Remember the mark of the beast? It's in the forehead or the hand. The forehead means you, you agree with it, you believe it. The hand means you're being forced to do it. Okay, even though you don't agree with it. And that's what the beast is doing. It's, it's, it's all the people in Europe there did not necessarily love the papacy, but they, quote, unquote, worshipped it. They obeyed it because it had the power. All right? So that's a definition we need to remember. All right. So you ever heard the, 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 the phrase, he's the spitting image of his dad, right? I found this online. I thought I'd put that out there. If that isn't uh, an example of that, I don't know what is, right? Well, that's what we're looking at when we're looking at this image of the beast. We're looking at something that's the spitting image of what the sea beast was doing, what the Roman church was doing in those days. All right. In Meyer's General History, page 455, he says this. Under him, this is speaking of Pope Innocent III, and he lived from 1198 to 1216. Pope Innocent was one of the, in fact, probably the most powerful pope that ever lived. Under him was very nearly made good the papal claim that all earthly sovereigns were mere vassals of the Roman pontiff. Almost all the kings and princes of Europe swore fealty to him as their overload. Rome was once more the mistress of the world. 
You see, this is, this is history now. We can read about this history, and history tells us that exactly what the Bible says in chapter 17, that all the world followed him, wandered after their beast, history tells us that's exactly what happened. So what we're looking at here is a union of church and state because God never intended for the church to coerce the state to do its bidding. But neither did, does the Bible ever teach that the state should force the church to do its bidding. There was to be a separation. And that's why our nation set that plan up when it was first um, um, founded, all right? A separation of church and state. But when you look at the history of the papal dominion, you see that there was a union of church and state. That the church, in fact, was on top, but when it wanted something done, when when it wanted heretics persecuted, it asked the state to send their armies out to persecute them. So the image that we're looking at is a union of church and state, where the state, or the church rather, will tell the state what to do. All right? He was granted, verse 15, he was granted to give power or to give breath to the image of that beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. That's an incredible power. That's exactly what Roman Catholicism did during those centuries, friends. I have a number of people that are wonderful friends of mine that are Catholics. We're not talking about the people, the Catholic people. We're talking about a system that is set up that it wants to rule the world. And it has not changed. Even though it's not on top now, if it had the chance, it would be. All right, let's continue. So the events surrounding this union that's going to take place in the, in the future, we'll, we see some of it uh, prophesied in Revelation 18. Her sins have reached to heaven. This union is going to create more and more sin. And God's going to get to the place, or it's going to get to the place where Armageddon breaks out uh, that is talked about in that chapter. Number two, she has lived luxuriously. There is no secret that the papacy and all the Catholic clergy lived in rich, incredible luxury in those centuries when, they, when she was in the ascendancy. I mean, if you own half the land of Europe, you've got a lot of power, right? You've got a lot of money. Not to say anything about the, all the money that came into the church from the people because they had to pay for their sins being forgiven. They had to pay for funerals. They had to pay for penance and all sorts of things. So he lives in luxury. Number three, she experiences natural disasters. The prophecy seems to indicate that there are going to be some more and more natural disasters that are going to make it harder and harder on, on the world, and it's going to turn more and more people to looking to the papacy. Uh, number four, God's judgments begin to fall on the land, Revelation 18, uh, 10, and her riches come to nothing finally. So that's what's headed, that's what we're headed for in the conclusion there. But what we're looking at here for the future is there's going to be spiritual decline, uh, probably natural disasters, social chaos, and economic difficulties that lead up to this church-state union. Now already, friends, we're getting echoes of that. If you've been paying attention to the news, you know that there's a huge movement out there uh, about climate change. And the Pope especially is pushing that really, really hard. I don't know if you're aware of that. But there's also these natural disasters that are happening, the wars that are taking place, not just in the Middle East, not just in Ukraine, but also in Burma, you know, in different places that we've forgotten about, and, and to say nothing of Congo. And so there's wars all over the place. There's a lot of oppression. And more and more of these are pushing people to talk about a new world order and a bringing together of, of churches and all with potentially the Pope at the top. Even in our own uh, nation, friends, we have history of some of our greatest um, justices saying things like this. The wall of separation between church and state is a metaphor based on bad history. That's from Chief Justice William Rehnquist. That is the foundation of our country, friends, of the separation of church and state. And yet he, in that position, says it's bad history. It's not true. There are people today that are pushing this issue. 
that we should be able to legislate Christianity or legislate our morality more than we're doing. It's going on, uh, some of it's coming to the surface, but a lot of it's underneath. And so this is, this is even in our own country that's happening. Goes on to tell us in Revelation 13, 16, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, he being the United States, that's a land beast, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, that no one may, what? Buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now let's take a look at this very carefully as we go through this. What we're talking about when it says may not buy or sell, what is that connected to? That's connected to our economy, okay? When people, when nations wanted to coerce other nations to do their bidding in the, ba- in the, in the past, typically what they would do is they would just have their armies show up, right? Militarily, they would coerce them into doing what they want them to do. But guess what's been happening in the last number of years? This is a graph that shows from 1970 to 2015 the use of economic weapons against people. Now, Revelation just said that the land beast here is going to cause people not to be able to buy or sell. Friends, that's economy. That's what you're buying and selling, money and stuff. And so you know, you've heard the sanctions that we put on Russia, on Iran, right, and different ones like that. They are sanctions against their economy, trying to pressure them into giving in to what we want them to do. And this has been a a weapon, as it were, a method that has been increasing all the time as history has gone on. There's another graph here from uh, 1950 down to very little that we ever used uh, the economy to pressure people to do anything. But look at that in 2016, gone sky high. We're using that as one of the major weapons to get people to do what we want them to do. That's exactly what the land beast is going to do. Pressure us that we can't buy or sell. Goes on. Uh, except one who has the mark of the beast or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Let's look at these three right here. Um, Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. So we want to look at 666 here tonight too. For it is the number of a man. His number is 666. So we all know about 666, right? You don't want a, a phone number that has 666 in it. You don't want a license plate. I've had people tell me, you know, I got a license plate and it said 666 on it. I I took it back, right? You don't want that. We all know we shouldn't have it, but we don't know why, what it means. All right, so let's look at this one at a time. The mark literally means its definition is a badge of servitude. All right, that's what the Greek word means. Name refers to character or authority. And a number refers to the nature of something. All right? So... Uh, For instance, in Exodus 33, verse 19, when Moses said, Lord, I want to see your face. Remember that? And the Lord said, you can't see my face and live. But he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. So he proclaims his name, and right after this, it talks about the mercy of, love, of God, the forgiveness of God, the love of God. That's the name. It's the character, you see. So that's what it's referring to. People could have the character of this beast power uh, that's, that's in the wrong. So when we look at these numbers, we look at seven in the Bible equaling perfection. Because when God created the heavens and the earth, he created them in seven days, right, according to the Bible. And he said, everything was good. It was perfect. So seven typically represents the the number of perfection. Six, on the other hand, represents the number of man. Because man was created on the sixth day. And unfortunately, it represents rebellion because man rebelled. Okay? So that's why there's three sixes there. All right, let's take a look at this number uh, uh, issue. Our Sunday visitor... Catholic source says the official title 
of the papacy is Vicarius Philae Dei, or Vicar of the Son of God. In one of their, um, uh, from one of their uh, cardinals, I should say, uh, temporal power of the Vicar of the Son of God, it's, he says, this is um, Edward Manning, uh, Cardinal Edward Manning. It was a dignified obedience to bow to the Vicar of the Son of God and to remit the arbitration of their griefs to one whom all wills consented to obey. So here he uses the title of, of the Pope here, the Vicar of the Son of God. And that would be, of course, in Latin when they would do it. And then also Arrhenius talks about how he found that the Associate of Latinos with the Latin language was Roman language, and that's what the Roman Catholic Church took up was Latin. For many years, it was, uh, the, the mass was only spoken in Latin. In fact, they're trying to get it back. And he felt like the Latinos referred to the 666. Now, I want to introduce you to something called uh, gematria. And this is where there is an association between numbers and letters of the alphabet. Now, I remember doing this when I was in school. You know, we had the Latin alphabet, you know, the Roman numerals, and you, there was a certain letter, or there was a certain number associated with each, with each letter. Now, what, what we don't understand is today, this is almost a dead uh, science, as it were. But back in those days, it was extremely common. The Greeks used it, the Romans used it, the, the Hebrews used it, uh, lots, and the Latin people used it, a lot of different people. And they found on uh, the walls of Pompeii, when they were digging it up, they found uh, some graffiti there. And it says, I love her whose name is 545. Now, what he had done is he'd taken her name, which was probably in Greek, and he transposed it into the numerical values of it. So I'm just sharing this to tell you that this was a very common thing in those days. They did it all the time. So when we take Germatria uh, and we apply it to the, the Pope's name, we find that it comes out to 666. Quite interesting. Uh, this is something that, that all the Protestant reformers understood. This is not new. This is very, very common. And so uh, it's, it's only one evidence for who the, the uh, sea beast is, but I it, it, find it fascinating. Now, the beast system... Uh, took human authority for the authority of Christ. It took man's tradition for God's word. It substituted law for the commands of God. And it took a counterfeit Sabbath for the true Sabbath. These are the, the, um, the highlights of the image of the beast the, or the, the, um, the nature of the beast. So what is the mark of the beast? How do we identify what that mark is? When we looked at the, the seal of God last night, we saw that God's seal contains his name, his title, and territory. You remember that? And we found that that was the seventh-day Sabbath. We also remember that when we identified the little horn power in Daniel 7 with the sea beast in Revelation 13, that the little horn said it would think to change times and laws, Right? And then I gave you this graph, I think, uh, we saw the similarities between these two beasts, the little horn and Revelation 13's beast. The lion was the same, the bear was the same, the leopard was the same, terrible iron teeth, dragon, very similar, ten horns, same, speaks great things, speaks blasphemy, very similar, reigns 1260 years, reigns 42 months, which is 1260. And then it changes times and laws, and then we have the mark of the beast. So it's reasonable to assume that the changing the times and the laws would be connected with the mark of the beast. All right? So let's take a look at this. Satan has attacked the Sabbath because it is a seal in God's law. And it tells us which God you worship. Remember we talked about that last night. Every religion has guidelines that point directly to its God. The Bible has guidelines that point per, per, point to its God, all right? Okay, since the final issue resolves, revolves around worship, what earthly religious power claims that it has authority to change God's law? Because the little horn says it will think to change God's times and God's law. So let's take a look at it. The mark of the beast must be the sign 
of the Roman church's authority. So what does the Roman church claim as its sign of authority? In Canon and Tradition, one of their books, page 263, the authority of the church could therefore not be bound to the authority of the scriptures because the church had changed the Sabbath into Sunday. All right? So what does it claim? It claims that the church had the authority to change the Sabbath, the seventh-day Sabbath, into Sunday, the first day of the week. So this is what, in their own literature, they claim they have the authority to do. All right? Let's continue. Not by a command of Christ, but by its own authority. So I'm taking these quotes directly from the source because I want you to see this is not just something that somebody has brought up. And by the way, if, if you have this concept that, well, this is Protestants bashing Catholicism, uh, wait till we get to Revelation uh, 17, and we'll be talking about Protestantism too, okay? So everybody is in the, um, in, in the, in the boat here tonight. All right, so not by its own authority, or by its own authority. In the Council of Laodicea, A.D. 327, this started early, friends, Christians shall not Judaize and be idle on Saturday, but the Lord's Day, which they considered to be Sunday, they shall especially honor, and as being Christians shall, if possible, do no work on that day. Doesn't it sound like they're changing? That's supposed to be what you're not supposed to do on Saturday, right? The Sabbath. But they're putting it on to Sunday. And then it goes on to say, if, however, they are found Judaizing, in other words, keeping Saturday, they shall be shut out from Christ. You see, remember I told you that apostasy, Paul told us that grievous wolves would come into the church after he was gone. And they would begin to draw disciples after themselves. This is what's taking place, friends. Unfortunately, there are uh, false doctrines that were coming into the church in those days. In the question box, one of the Catholic's um, major publications uh, during a, the 1900s there, 1900s when it was, uh, the question came in, the Bible says that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. And we read in your literature that it is the only Bible Sabbath there is. Will you please explain how the Sunday of worship originated? Answer, if you follow the Bible alone, there can be no question that you are obliged to keep Saturday holy, since that is the day especially prescribed by the Almighty God to be kept holy to the Lord. In keeping Sunday, non-Catholics are simply following the practice of the Catholic Church for 1,800 years, a tradition and not a Bible ordinance. Okay, let's continue. In uh, the Converts Catechism, Catechism of Catholic Doctrine, page 50, what is the third commandment? The third commandment is, remember that thou keep, keep holy the, thir the Sabbath day. Which is the Sabbath day? Saturday is the Sabbath day. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday because, instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. This is by Peter Gierman. I have this con his uh, catechism at home. So, so, friends, this is their explanation for the change in the days here, that they changed that day. Incidentally, I don't know if you noticed here, but it says the third commandment. Uh, we'll look at that in just a second. You've got a handout to that, too. But in the Catholic Encyclopedia, here is what it says. Uh, volume 4, page 153. The church, after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath to the seventh day of the week, to the first, made the third commandment refer to Sunday as the day to be kept as the Lord's day. You know why they did that? Because they took out the third commandment that says, thou shalt not bow down to graven images. Because that's what the Catholics do with their saints. And then they split the 10th commandment into two. Your handout shows that, okay? So this is what they say, and here it is. I've got it on the, on the, on the screen here. So they move the fourth commandment, which is in the Jewish Bible and also in the Orthodox uh, Bible and Protestant Bibles, uh, but in the Catholic Bible, it is the third commandment because they took out that commandment about worshiping or bowing down to idols. You'll recall that I showed this decretal um, a couple of weeks ago. The Pope has power to change times, 
to abrogate laws. What did it say in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25? Think to change times and laws. They say it right out, friends. To abrogate laws, abrogate means to do away with. And to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. And then from the office of Cardinal Gibbons, a very famous cardinal. Of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act. And the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious manners. Talking about the change of Sabbath to Sunday. They come out and say it's their mark of authority. Very clearly. I'm not making these up. You can go on the internet and find these. In the Catholic record, page, or, or September 1st, 1923, okay, we're advancing in time. What I'm doing here, friends, I'm, I'm showing you historically, from the very beginning, the church has promoted this. From 325, was it, the Laodicean um, uh, Council, all the way up now to uh, 1923. They're saying the same thing. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible. And this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. It goes on, the Catholic Universe Bulletin, um, August 14th, 1942. The Roman Catholic Church changed the observance of Sabbath to Sunday by right of the divine infallibility or infallible authority given to her by her founder, Jesus Christ. That is very questionable, but that's what they believe. The Protestant claiming the Bible is to be the only guide of faith has no warrant for observing Sunday. In this matter, the Seventh-day Adventist is the only consistent Protestant. You see, they come out, friends, uh, decade after decade, century after century, saying the same thing. I'll say one thing for them. They're very consistent. I mean to be consistent in how they look at this from 325 A.D. all the way up here now to 1942. That's amazing. They're very consistent. But I'm not done yet, because in 1957, uh, Catechism of Catholic, uh, Catholic Doctrine, they say, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Sabbath, Saturday? We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church and the Council of Laodicea transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. So they keep publishing this because they want their people to understand this. May 21st, 1995, we're getting pretty close to home now. Uh, St. Catherine Catholic uh, Church of uh, Sentinel. I think this is down in Detroit, if I remember right. Perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church ever did happened in the first century. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday. Not from any directions noted in the scriptures, but from the church's sense of its own power. People who think that the scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. So again, claiming now we're down into the end of the last century, they're still claiming the mark of their authority to be able to change the Sabbath to Sunday. Now, what about Sunday in the New Testament? There are actually eight texts in the New Testament that mention the first day of the week, and not one of them, listen to me now, not one of them tells us to worship on Sunday in honor of the resurrection. Not one of them. And you would think that they got that from there, but the Catholic Church even says, there's no authority in scriptures for us changing the day. Jesus says in Revelation 3, 19 to the seven churches, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes the mark of the beast, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Now, I want it to be clear tonight that no one has the mark of the beast yet. Okay? The mark of the beast will not come until religious persecution or religious legislation is passed enforcing the substitute Sabbath. Do you know, friends, that already in the United States of America, there have been Sunday laws that have come up on the books wanting to be passed? Before the turn of the century in 1900, there was one, it was called the Blair Bill, and they wanted to enact that into law. 
that Sunday would become sacred. So this is not a new thing. It's not, not something that is way out in left field. There are people in Congress now that would like this to take place. In the future, the final issue of loyalty will center around worship. In the days of Noah, God invited his people to take a stand, didn't he? There was a serious problem there. In fact, they were going to lose their lives if they didn't listen to Noah. In the days of Daniel, God invited his people to take a stand too. They were not to bow down to that false image. And there were probably other Hebrews in that vast assembly, friends, but only three of them chose not to bow down. In the days of Jesus, God invited his people to take a stand. And you know what happened? They all forsook him, denied him. In the days of the early Christians, God invited his people to take a stand when they were being persecuted. And many hundreds of thousands, millions, lost their lives because they were willing to stand on a thus saith the Lord instead of a thus saith the church. In the dark ages, God invited his people to take a stand. They fled into the wilderness and the Lord took care of them. Our historic freedoms will be challenged, friends. Prophecy is clear. If there's anything that we have learned about prophecy is that we can trust it. Amen? Revelation eleven nineteen. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. We see, friends, we're looking at the, the end of man's history here. We're on the threshold. You know, people will say they believe the Lord is coming, and they'll talk about the earthquakes we're having. We'll talk about the wars and rumors of wars. I said this before, but this is one of the major reasons why I know Jesus is coming soon, because he's in the most holy place right now. We're at the end of earth's history. There is not going to be much more time. Jesus is there pleading his blood for you and I above the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Catholic record says very clearly, Sunday is our mark of authority. But here's the question I want to leave you with tonight. Who has the authority to say that the church is above the Bible? When we have read scripture after scripture, in fact, at the end of Revelation, it says, He who adds to this book or takes away from it, I will add the plagues to them. Right? Does that sound like God that does that sound like God has given a church or a person the authority to change his law, his his word? No church has the ability, has the right to do that. And yet we have a church today in existence that says the church is above the Bible. And it has the authority to change the very symbol that points out which God you're worshiping. We need to respond like Peter did in Acts 5.29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. So where do you stand tonight? The Bible has presented two different altars at the end of time. There's one where people are following the lamb wherever he goes, and the lamb symbol is the Ten Commandments. In the center of the Ten Commandments is the Sabbath. It's a sign of his creatorship. Or we have the other altar where we have the beast, all the world's following the beast, and, and the beast clearly says over and over again that its mark of, of authority is its ability to change the law of God in spite of the fact that the Bible says not to change it. I'd like uh, our ushers to hand out our card tonight because I want to hear from you. I know that for some of you, this is probably a very difficult subject. And you've not heard about it this way before. So I want you to talk to me. And so I'm passing out, I'm asking them to pass out this card. I want you to fill it out. Put down your address. Put down uh, questions that you have. If you would like a visit to be able to talk about this, because I can't share everything up here in one night. But if you'd like a visit, you know, let me know. 
and we'll come out and visit and walk you through this in a more methodical way. But you know, Romans 2, verse uh, 12 and 13 says, For all who have sinned without the law will perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Friends, when Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments, what does he mean? And here is a real critical issue that you and I need to understand. You and I know from the Bible that it says that we are saved by grace, right? Not by works. So Jesus is not talking about working your way to heaven. He's talking about how you respond in love. This is not a hard thing, friends. Every single one of us that's ever been a parent, we understand what he's talking about. Because we know that our children love us if they do what? If they obey our commands, right? We know that they have a problem with us when they don't obey. Isn't that right? I mean, we all go through that as parents. This is where God is coming from. If you love me, obey me. Just show me that you love me by doing the things I want you to do. That's the cry of every parent that's ever lived, right? That's all it is. It's not about getting into your parents' graces by doing what they want. They already love you. They're already going to die for you, right? Am I right, parents? Yeah, but you want them to show their love by simply doing the things that you ask them to do. And that's what God is wanting here when he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, as we close tonight, and I apologize, we've taken a little bit more time, important subject, but this brings up an issue here that maybe some of you are struggling with, maybe you aren't. Because you might be saying, well, Pastor Stewart, you're talking an awful lot about the law, the law, the law. I thought we were saved by grace, right? Well, on Thursday night, we're going to deal with that issue, okay? Because we're going to show from the Bible what it does say about the law and how we're saved. And I'll tell you right now, yes, we are saved by grace, not by what we do. And praise the Lord for that, because we, none of us would be saved. But... Jesus said this. I didn't. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So evidently the commandments are still in there, right? So let's see on Thursday night how those blend, how those work together, and we'll see what the Bible says, what God meant as uh, he did that. Let's pray as we close. Father in heaven, Lord, this is an incredibly serious issue. And we've discovered tonight that the mark of the beast is Sunday. Nobody has that mark yet. But when it becomes legislated, and when the beast power seeks to make it the law of the land, then everyone on this planet will have to make a decision to either obey that law or to obey God's law. That's when the mark of the beast will take place. And so, Father, we pray that you'll help us to be ready. And for those of us that are struggling and wrestling with us in our minds, Please, Lord, send your Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. In Jesus' name we pray.